Well, welcome everybody to episode 27 of EV Society's Canada Talks Electric Cars webinar. We are uh, in for a real treat tonight with two special guests. When it comes to encouraging more rapid EV adoption in Canada, we have a host of options to consider. Most would be characterized as coming in the form of either a stick or a carrot. Well, last month we heard from Canada's automakers who understandably favor the carrot with purchase incentives and charging infrastructure seen as key. Today, we focus more closely on the stick options. These include, for example, government mandates on manufacturers to reach EV sales and production targets for their respective markets. Underpinning the entire discussion, and something we hear an awful lot about uh, lately, is electric vehicle affordability in Canada. So just how affordable are they in this country? These are the topics that we'll tackle today. Jason Arnault is here once again to relay uh, the most popular questions arising from the presentations. Please use Zoom's Q&A tool and also free, feel free to upvote questions from others that you also wish to have answered. And as is our practice, we will shut this webinar down precisely at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. So as I say, today we welcome two amazing professionals from the EV and clean energy space to the webinar. They will deliver their presentation separately and then uh, sit as a panel to take your questions. First up will be Joanna Cariasis, Program Manager at Clean Energy Canada. Joanna works to develop and advance policy solutions that address climate change while promoting clean growth with a specific focus on transportation. Based in Ottawa, she regularly connects with industry stakeholders and policymakers at the federal level. And before joining Clean Energy Canada, Joanna worked as a management consultant, helping businesses identify and manage climate change risks and opportunities. She also practiced as a lawyer, advising governments and industry on climate change and energy law. Following Joanna's presentation, um, we'll be uh, treated with a talk from Daniel Bretton, President of Electric Mobility Canada which is, by the way, one of the oldest associations dedicated to the electrification of transportation in the world. This organization has more than 150 members, including electricity suppliers, vehicle manufacturers, utilities, and many other key stakeholders. A former Quebec, Quebec Minister of the Environment, Sustainable Development, Wildlife and Parks, Daniel was the first elected official in charge of a government strategy for the electrification of transportation in Canada. And that was back in 2012. He graduated in sustainable carbon management and has written several books on the subject of transportation, electrification, climate change, air pollution, and energy transition. How fortunate we are to have these two great panelists uh, joining us today. I'm going to start with Joanna. Hey, Joanna, welcome back to uh, Canada Talks. I'll say welcome back because uh, you were good enough to join us. Uh, I guess it was a year and a half ago, thereabouts. And uh, we're just so pleased to, uh, to have you back. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. Oh, well, well, we've got lots to cover in this episode. So um, I'm just going to, as I say, get out of the way and let you uh, set the stage for us. All right, thanks very much. I'll share my presentation. Okay, so um, I'm going to start off by talking about EV affordability. Now, Clean Energy Canada is often touting electric vehicles as a really good climate solution, um, as well as a way for Canadians to save money at the pump. But a few months ago, we wanted to dig further into this issue and um, understand just how affordable EVs really are or on, aren't. And, and that would be to provide a clearer picture to Canadian consumers who are seriously considering an EV as their next vehicle. Uh, so what we did was we compared six popular uh, electric car models in Canada uh, on a total cost of ownership basis with gas equivalents. We looked at uh, everything from purchase price to fuel and maintenance costs, insurance costs. Uh, we were inspired by a similar study that came out of the U.S. around the same time and thought, you know what, we should recreate this in Canada and see, see what the differences are. 
In terms of what we found, with just one exception, the electric version of every car that we analyzed uh, came out ahead on a total cost of ownership basis, often in the range of ten to fifteen thousand dollars more so. And so we found, you know, these savings are are quite significant. Now, before I go into the, the findings and the comparisons of each kind of vehicle standoff, I'm sure um, already some of your listeners are thinking or asking questions about what sort of assumptions went into our analysis. Um, so I'm going to run through those first uh, so you can pay attention to the results when they, when they are being presented. First, the gas price that we used um, for the analysis was uh, the average gas price over the course of the last year up to the day that we did this analysis, which, which was in March, April. Um, and, and this is across Canada average. So we used a dollar uh, 45 per liter. For the electricity price, we similarly wanted to calculate an average. Um, so we did a, a province uh, based weighted average. Uh, from 2021. And so it turned out to be 14 cents per kilowatt hour. That's coming from a, a Hydro-Quebec cross Canada comparison of electricity prices. We assumed that um, the vehicles would be driven about 20,000 kilometers per year, which is from Natural Resource Canada's uh, fuel consumption guide. We assumed a split of about 55% driving in cities and 45% uh, highway driving. That's from that same NRCAN uh, fuel consumption guide. Um, we assumed that the vehicle would be owned uh, for eight years. That's coming from that US study that we were inspired by. Um, you know, the, I think the timeline might be slightly longer in Canada. Um, we did want to incorporate the, the impacts of uh, available EV purchase incentives in Canada. So we applied the, the $5,000 federal incentive across the board, you know, where the vehicle is eligible for that uh, incentive. And then we also did a calculation to try to um, figure out, you know, what would the average provincial rebate be um, based on an EV sales weighted average? I think it turned out to be, you know, 2000 and something per province. Um, so what that would mean is if you're, if you're living in Ontario or Alberta, some of the cost savings from EVs will be slightly um, uh, over, uh, no, over, yeah, overrepresented. If you're living in BC or Quebec, they're going to be slightly underrepresented because this was a national study. Uh, second to last, we did want to include the, the impact of a rising carbon price. And so um, we used the $50 per ton uh, in 2022 that would rise over time. And then finally, we assumed that about 88% of EV charging would be done at home. Um, and that is taking a mid-range uh, that was provided in a, a U.S. Uh, national laboratory report. Um, so again, we had to we had to make some decisions. Some of these might not be exactly what your situation is, but uh, but we think that it provides a pretty good picture. Now on to the results. So the first comparison that we made was um, Canada's uh, favorite long range electric vehicle, or most affordable long range electric vehicle, I should say, uh, the Chevy Bolt. And we pitted that against the uh, uh, Canada's top selling budget friendly car, gas car, the Toyota Corolla hatchback. What we found was after eight years of ownership, uh, the Chevy Bolt came out ahead by uh, almost 15 grand. So that's how, that's how many cost savings are, the, the dollar amount of cost savings that you would expect to receive if you chose the EV in this situation. Um, under the SUV and crossover category, we uh, compared the electric version of the Hyundai Kona with the gas version. And despite the gas version being $20,000 cheaper up front, uh, at the end of the day, or after eight years of ownership, the electric Kona came out ahead by about 10000 Moving into the, the premium vehicles category, 
um, we decided to put the Tesla Model 3 up against the, the Lexus CS250. The cost savings here, the, the Tesla still came out ahead after eight years. The cost savings were less significant, only about 2000 uh, And that's in part because the Tesla Model 3 is no longer eligible for any um, uh, federal rebates. So, uh, you know, we, we removed that $5,000 in, in cost savings that you may have enjoyed if you if you purchased a Tesla Model 3 a year or two ago. Now, the one exception where the electric version of the vehicle did not win out against its gas counterpart was the Ford F-150 Lightning. Um, this is uh, this is due to you know the 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 Ford Lightning is still it still has a pretty high upfront cost in Canada at least, um, and it is not eligible for any uh, federal or provincial rebates at this time. Now, looking at the U.S., Ford Motor Company has um, introduced a more cost-friendly uh, Ford F-150 Lightning option. I think it's coming in at around $40,000 U.S., um, the base model. We're really hoping to see something similar come to Canada, uh, a, a competitively priced Lightning um, option, in part because... Uh, the Ford F-150 is the, the best-selling vehicle in the country. We'd really love to see more Canadians benefit from the electric version. And if we do see a lower cost option come into the country, um, then hopefully it would also be eligible for um, the federal rebate, which uh, was recently modified to uh, make certain SUVs and, and pickup trucks eligible. Um, in terms of where the majority of the cost savings uh, came from in each of these comparisons, a big chunk was from refueling costs. And so, you know, I think Canadians at a high level understand that charging an EV is much cheaper or is cheaper than filling up a gas car. I don't think people realize like just how cheap it is. Before doing this analysis, to be honest, I didn't realize how cheap it was to fill to fill your car up. So, um, and we couldn't find any numbers out there that talked about if you want to fill a battery up from empty to full, how much is it going to cost you at home? Uh, so what we did was we chose what we thought would be considered, you know, a typical electric car. Um, again, we we worked with the 2022 Chevy Bolt. Um, it offers uh, over 400 kilometers of range. And we calculated how much it would cost to fill that vehicle's battery up from empty to full in each province across the country. The results are right here. And the answer is uh, it ranges from about $5 in the cheapest jurisdiction of Quebec to just over $12 in the most expensive jurisdiction uh, of PEI. Now compare that to your most recent gas bill, which for many of us was over $100. Uh, and remember, this was all calculated before we started seeing uh, gas prices of $2 per liter like we are uh, today. Now, speaking of uh, $2 per liter gas prices, we, we did choose to go with a more conservative gas price so that, you know, we weren't picking just the worst time in recent history to, to buy a, a gas car. Um, but we were curious what $2 per liter gas prices would do uh, to the analysis and how much it would change our findings. So we ran a bit of a sensitivity analysis. Uh, and just to give you a, a sample of the impact that higher gas prices uh, do have on, on the overall calculations, here's the first comparison uh, that I presented. So the Chevy Bolt against the, uh, the Toyota hatchback. When we use the dollar forty-five per liter gas price, the overall EV savings were in were about fifteen thousand. If you increase the gas price to two dollars per liter, uh, those savings increased to twenty-two thousand dollars over the course of eight years. So it really makes a difference. Uh, in a two dollar per liter scenario, even the Ford F one fifty Lightning uh, comes out ahead. Uh, over eight years by about $8,000. And again, that's in, assuming there's no federal rebate or provincial rebate available. So right now is a great time to buy an electric vehicle. 
Um, one of the common refrains that we hear uh, when we are presenting these um, arguments is that great electric vehicle owners can enjoy cost savings over time, but you know, not everybody can wait eight years um, to, uh, to enjoy those. They're thinking about you know, monthly bills and, and their costs on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I guess what, or what I wanted to show here was depending on your situation, uh, an electric vehicle can be more affordable today. You know, you can start saving today. So Danielle, my co-panelist here, was um, was uh, great enough to, to send over this analysis right before the webinar. And what this looks at is a Honda HRV gas vehicle compared to the Chevy Bolt. If you live in Alberta today, um, he looked up the the amount of financing, those commas should be periods. Sorry, I uh, I took the, the French version of, of some of his calculations and not the others. Um, so he, he put here the uh, monthly financing costs as well as your monthly fuel bill based on you know gas prices and electricity prices this week. Uh, and he and he found that um, the gas car will cost you more on a on a monthly basis already from the start than the Chevy Bolt. So it's really important to run some of these calculations when you're deciding uh, which vehicle to to choose for your next car purchase. Now, of course, where um, EVs are still more expensive up front, rebates or purchase incentives can help. Um, the federal government has continued to pour money into um, the, the federal uh, purchase incentive program, the ISEF program. Uh, so $5, up to $5,000 is, is available to Canadians through the federal government. And then a growing number of provinces and territories have started to offer um, their own purchase incentives that can be stacked with the federal one. Notably, uh, Ontarians and the Prairie Provinces do not get any extra help. So we're really hoping to see those governments step up in the coming months and years um, and offer more support to help consumers unlock those substantial savings that, that you can see by going electric over time. Now, one thing that I uh, just wanted to mention here is we've been uh, polling Canadians for the last three to four years on a pretty regular basis to, to check in on their attitudes towards electric vehicles and how things are changing over time. Um, one thing that we have found recently is that Canadians uh, are understanding more and more um, the benefits of EVs. So here's a recent poll that we did around the Ontario election on the left, showing that 63% um, of Canadians uh, do know that an EV will end up either much cheaper or a bit cheaper than a gas car over time. Uh, our most recent uh, national EV poll also showed that about 80% of Canadians are open to buying an electric vehicle. So again, the, the, the levels of interest are high and the more Canadians are being educated about EVs, the more we're seeing this translate into strong uh, sustained demand for those vehicles. Unfortunately, it's pretty impossible to find an EV that you can drive home today. Um, so the EV supply is, is uh, a huge bottleneck and continues to be a problem that needs to be solved in Canada. Wait lists for popular models are, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, you know, six months to a year and a half or more. Um, now, fortunately, the, the federal government recently announced that Canada would be getting a national zero emission vehicle sales mandate which would uh, require automakers to sell an increasing percentage of EVs in the country. Uh, and that can certainly help. Um, that is what Danielle is going to be talking to you more about today. So I will turn it over to him to continue. Thanks, Joanna. Danielle, you're uh, welcome to share your screen. Hi, thanks a lot. Great presentation, Joanna, by the way. And, uh, and, uh, if I might add something to what Joanna just said, you have to can you have to keep in mind that if um, many provinces like Prairie provinces in Ontario don't have uh, a rebate, and there's the rebate on the federal level, 
for self-employed people or uh, people who have companies, they can take advantage of the tax deduction, which is very generous. And actually, I know some people who, instead of taking the $5,000 rebate, the federal rebate, they would take the tax deduction instead, and they they, they got ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 back. So that's something to look at if you're self-employed. Okay, so let's start my presentation. Um, why do we badly need a ZEV mandate? Well, there are many reasons. I've been, I've been working on these issues for almost two decades now, and uh, I was one of the one of those people who uh, convinced the Quebec government to adopt a Quebec ZEV mandate, although not stringent enough. I mean, it got us going. That's why forty five percent of EVs now in Canada are in Quebec, but uh, we have to accelerate the pace everywhere in the country. So. Why do we need a ZEV mandate? Four main reasons. First of all, climate change to lower our emissions, better air quality, lower our healthcare costs, EV supply for Canadians, like uh, Joanna mentioned, and market predictability. Uh, oh, and by the way, before I forget, if at the end of my presentation, there are people who want to ask questions in French, uh, I will answer in French. So, if there are questions in French, I will answer in French. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, lower GHG emissions. So transportation is Canada's second source of GHG emissions, GHG direct or downstream emissions. So it's 24% in 2020, um, just, just after uh, oil and gas emissions at 26%. Uh, between 1990 and 2020, emissions from the transport sector grew by 32%, but actually, 2020 was a bizarre year, as we all know, because of COVID. Because of COVID, a lot of people didn't take their car, didn't travel. So it's it's an odd year. So I'm pretty convinced that it, when we start looking at 2022, the emissions will grow up, go up quite quite a lot. Um, meeting our ZEV adoption targets is an extremely important part of reaching our GHG emission reduction target of four, minus 40 to minus 45 below 2005 levels by 2030. Market forces alone have shown to be insufficient to increase the number of ZEV sales to the level required to meet those targets because manufacturers prioritize regulated markets for the sale of, for the sale of their zero emission vehicles. One thing that I would like to mention is the fact that when we're talking about GHG emissions from the transport sector, we often tend to forget the upstream GHG emissions. Uh, and uh, according to uh, the, the oil and gas sector from Canada, we have to add another 24% of GHG emissions from the transport sector, which means that in the end, <clears throat> when we add uh, upstream and downstream emissions from the transport sector, we add 29.75% approximately, meaning that in fact, the transport sector is the number one sector in Canada for GHG emissions. You might already know about this. Canada is number one in the world for its light duty vehicle fleet, GHG emissions and fuel consumption, meaning actually we're the worst in the world. So that's according to a 2019 report from the International Energy Agency. Uh, so we can do much better than that. So we have to we, we have to go from being the worst to being among the best. So we have to accelerate. There are many ways. One of them, one very important way to accelerate our um, EV adoption and uh, GHG emissions reduction is to adopt a ZEV mandate amongst other uh, solutions. Now, one thing that we don't discuss that much, and uh, I want to talk about this, is air pollution, because very often people tend to forget that, yes, climate change is important, but air pollution is very important as well. According to a 2021 Health Canada report, the the estimation made by Health Canada um, is at $120 billion. So that's the economic cost of air pollution in Canada, $120 billion, 15,300 deaths a year. That's eight times the death toll of uh, car accidents on the road. So a stringent ZEV mandate will accelerate EV adoption, which in return will reduce air pollution in cities across Canada. Um, so this health cost is very important and we must not underestimate it, uh, the fact that uh, electric vehicles will make quite a difference. Actually, when I was in Oslo about a month and a half ago, 
uh, it, it felt like I was a former smoker, meaning that when you used to smoke and you stop smoking, every person that comes by and that smokes in front of you really bothers you. So when you are in Norway, let's say in Oslo, where many electric cars, uh, you know, travel and commute around the, the, the city, you can feel the the gas cars when they come by because they are not that popular anymore. So it does make a difference on your daily life and your quality of life. And to me, that's something that was really uh, very, imp that's something that I really noticed when I was there. Just to give you an an idea of how much air pollution comes from transport plus oil and gas, according to a 2020 ECCC report, they account, these two sectors, for 68% of Canada nitrogen oxide emissions, 44% of Canada's volatile organic compound emissions, 43% of Canada's carbon monoxide emissions, and 37% of Canada's black carbon emissions. Obviously, it's not just from cars, it's cars, trucks, uh, but mainly road transportation. Now, a lot of people say that we don't need a ZEV mandate, that uh, voluntary measures will do the trick. Uh, well, I'm old enough to remember things like voluntary measures. Um, in 2005, the federal government signed a voluntary agreement with the OEMs to lower their GHG emissions by 5.3 megatons of CO2 equivalent in 2010. So I looked at the number recently, and according to the 2021 GHG report from ECCC, uh, what's happened is because there was no regulation, it was just voluntary, uh, Canada missed the target by 95%. So it means that voluntary measures have never worked, don't work, and won't work. So that's why we need regulation. To say that we just, uh, like Tim said, you know, more carrots, but no sticks, uh, to me, uh, shows that Corporate responsibility um, in itself does not do the trick. We have to regulate. We don't have a choice. And it was the same thing back in the day for seat belts and airbags and anti-pollution system. We have to regulate. It's not the market that will bring airbags. And uh, uh, that it's not the market that brought airbags or uh, seat belts. It was regulation. For those of you who remember about this, in 2011, the governments of Canada and Ontario both invested $70.8 million each to assemble the Toyota RAV4 EV in Ontario. But all, all the models were never sold in Canada. Governments, I mean, uh, citizens who wanted to buy a Toyota RAV4 EV in Ontario, they could live three kilometers away from the plant. They could not buy one because since there was no regulation and no rebate in Ontario or in Canada, for that matter, back in 2011, all these vehicles, because of regulation in the U.S., they were all sent to the U.S. Now the governments are reinvesting billions in EV assembly plants and ZEV mandate, a ZEV mandate is necessary to ensure that Canadian built EVs supported by Canadian citizens' funds are available to Canadian drivers. The majority of dealerships right now in Canada have no EVs or an inventory. Less than a quarter of dealerships have three or more in stock. Outside of Quebec, BC, and Ontario, only 18% of dealerships have any ZEVs available, and only 4% have five or more. So I'm sure you all know this already. It's very hard to be able to find a zero-emission vehicle, whether it's a plug-in hybrid or full battery electric vehicle. Uh, Joanna mentioned this. Uh, most of the dealers that I talk to, because I talk to many dealers, I've done so for decades now, they're telling me that uh, they're unhappy because they, more and more of them want to sell electric cars, and they can't. There's nothing, and they don't get any news. But when I was in Norway, I went to some dealerships, and they had some in inventory over there. One thing I'm hearing is that there are more and more models coming to market. So more and more models, but that doesn't mean more supply. I mean, now we have almost twice as many electric cars, uh, different models offered in Canada than there used to be five years ago, but there's less supply. So in, two, in 2022, 11 years after the RAV4 EV announcement by the government of Canada and Ontario, many EVs and PHEVs are still hard to, either far hard to find or simply unavailable in many Canadian provinces and territories. And to me, the prime example is the Prime, the Toyota RAV4 Prime, which you have to wait for between two to three years, which I find ridiculous. 
And people talk about microchip shortage. So let me tell you about microchip shortage. There is indeed a microchip shortage, but keep in mind that I remember four or five years ago, I had a discussion with people from Toyota. And uh, back then they were launching the Toyota RAV4 hybrid. And they were telling me before COVID, before talking about microchip, that they did not have enough batteries to, uh, to be able to supply enough uh, hybrid vehicles for the world market because they said there's so much more demand and there is supply that it's a problem. And I was stunned to hear that because after all, Toyota has been selling hybrid vehicles for a quarter of a century now. So this is to me what I call catalog engineering, meaning that instead of uh, developing a whole supply chain linked to electric vehicles from mining to battery, to mining, to cells, to packs, to batteries, uh, most manufacturers in the world have either outsourced supply of batteries to third parties like LGs and Samsung and others. Um, so what that means is that they have not developed a supply chain for vehicles that would be electric. And you have to keep in mind that many OEMs, many manufacturers, not only have not planned for the rise of electric vehicle sales, but many have fought the rise of electric vehicle sales. So it's obvious nowadays that some of them are really stuck and uh, what we're seeing is that when I went to Norway, as I, as I told you, this is a picture of uh, uh, that I took when I was uh, close to Oslo. There's a Hyundai and a Nissan dealer. 95% of the vehicles on the lot and in the store were electric. This is not something that we see in Canada. Actually, when I was in Toronto a few weeks ago, I went to see some different dealers, different brands, and I asked them how long before I get an electric car in Ontario, and it was basically between a year and three years. When you are in a country like Norway, which is not by any means a big market. I mean, there's less people in Norway than there is in Quebec. And they said, depending on the model, between a couple of months and six to nine months. But you can get one right now if you get a demo. So people could get some and you know go away within a few days with an electric car. Keep in mind that more and more countries and jurisdictions are regulating the sales of electric cars. In the US, there are 15 states and three provinces making up 36% of the US Canada car market, which have zero emission vehicle standards, either planned or implemented. So right now we have two provinces with electric, uh, with the ZEV mandate, and there's another one planning on it. So what that means is that the more stringent regulation is going to be around the world and Europe is getting more and more stringent. That's where most OEMs send their electric cars in priority to the European market or the Chinese market or the ZEV states market. That means that if we don't have a federal ZEV mandate, we will get the crumbs. We will end up having what's left over. And uh, on the other hand, with a ZEV mandate, with a federal ZEV mandate, it's going to bring market predictability, both for infrastructure, for electric car sales, and it will have a serious effect on attracting world players in Canada. And we've already seen it. Since the government announced that they would come up with a ZEV mandate last year, about a year, uh, maybe uh, 13 months ago, we have seen more and more OEMs interested in coming to Canada because they saw market predictability. And I spoke to Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne a couple of months ago, and they said they are seeing that the Canadian government is serious about this. So that's why they want to invest, because they know there's going to be market predictability. And I can tell, even tell you that some leading OEMs agree with the ZAV mandate, because they're saying we can call our supplier, whether it's in Korea, Japan, or Europe, and say, now we have a ZEV mandate, we need more electric cars. So it's going to help those leading OEMs who want to sell more electric cars in Canada, get them because of that ZEV mandate. Obviously, laggards, those OEMs who don't want to transition or have a, pro a problem transitioning are fighting ZEV mandates. 
to say that we need more rebates. Rebates are not sufficient on their own. And we are seeing that here in this, uh, in this chart where we see that provinces with a rebate or no mandate have lower sales than provinces or states with rebates and mandates. And that's something that we are seeing in Atlantic Canada where all Atlantic Canada provinces have rebates now, but they are really having problems to get enough electric cars. Some people mentioned the fact that in BC, they sell more electric cars than they do in Quebec, because in Quebec, we do have a ZEV mandate. And they say, see, that's the proof that the ZEV mandate doesn't work because they sell more electric cars in BC than they sell in Quebec. And they even some of them say even say that uh, we need to raise the rebate. But the, the, the truth of the matter is that nowadays, the rebate in Quebec is at $7,000. The rebate in BC is at $3,000. And yet, they sell more EVs there than Quebec does per capita. Why is that? Well, very simply, it's because the ZEV mandate in Quebec is not stringent enough. Um, just to give you an example, between now and 2024, the ZEV requirements from the government of Quebec is below 10%. But if you look at Q1 sales in Quebec, they were at 12.7%. What that means is that there is no pressure whatsoever for OEMs to sell electric cars in Quebec. So that's why Quebec is starting to lag behind BC and California. So let's talk about the four pillars of ZEV adoption success because ZEV mandate is very important, but it's not the only key. We obviously may need ZEV rebates for the time being until the price gets closer and closer to price parity, for the purchase price, I mean. The ZEV mandate is absolutely necessary for us to be able to have enough supply. Infrastructure deployment. Obviously, right now, we don't have enough uh, chargers installed across the country. Uh, in Quebec, we're spoiled. We have Hydro-Quebec and the Circuit Electric that does a great job. In BC, they're doing a great job as well. But in between, there are some lags. There are some holes, I would say. So we need to accelerate uh, infrastructure deployment. If you remember, the federal government has announced in the April budget that we will need to have, um, we, I mean, they, they plan to install 50,000 public chargers between now and 2027. We will need to add more to that, but you have to keep in mind that the private sector also is investing and will keep investing in uh, public infrastructure. Which brings me to this. There was a press conference a couple of weeks ago where uh, some automotive representatives said that we need 1.6 million public chargers to be able to keep up you know, to be able to uh, to reach our 2035 100% ZEV sales target. And um, I was stunned to see such an outlandish num number because uh, I've been working in this business for a very, very long time, more than two decades, actually. And uh, when we're looking at the data, it doesn't add up at all. So obviously, there is some misunderstanding about what the EV industry is, how EVs work, the EV ecosystem. And there was uh, an ICCT report for EV infrastructure needs for Quebec that was published a few months ago. And they said that between now and 2035, the province will need approximately 52,000 public chargers by 2030, 79,000 public chargers by 2035. Considering that Quebec now has about 45% of the EV flight in Canada, let's say that between now and 2030, that percentage goes down or decreases to 25%. We would add, we would multiply that by four, which means that by 2030, Canada would need approximately 200,000 public chargers and approximately 315 public chargers by 2035, which is so far from 1.6 million public chargers. So we're getting closer in reality to what the federal government has announced, 50,000 plus all, already more than 30,000 being installed right now. So this is closer to reality. But you have to keep in mind that since technology evolves so quickly with better batteries, solid state batteries, faster charger, we do not want to speculate until 35 because the private sector will invest and more and more 
uh, will be invested to, to develop EV infrastructure deployment. But keep in mind that as battery technology gets more efficient, charging gets faster, we will most probably need less chargers, but more powerful chargers, especially along highway routes. So that's it for me. Thanks a lot. Merci. Thanks very much, Daniel and Joanna. That was those were two very interesting uh, presentations. So I'm going to uh, pass things over to Jason. A reminder to all of you watching that uh, to uh, we, we can't recognize raised hands. Please uh, enter your comments into the Q and A. And if you are comfortable, more comfortable uh, posing a question en français, please go ahead and do it. Uh, Daniel will be glad to uh, to address it. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Joanna and Daniel. The first question is uh, related to your EV charger comments. A common argument against EV adoption is that our energy grids cannot support it. Is this true? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, so uh, at, at Electric Mobility Canada, we have a utility working group that especially dedicates time and effort to work on this. It's more about distribution and production. And uh, because of smart energy management, uh, we will uh, actually be able to uh, come up with solutions that will make not only, I would say, uh, the grid more efficient, but it will make sure that we end up saving more and more money because we will charge at a time when there's not that much demand. Uh, and actually, uh, during our conference in September in Toronto, it, that's time for a plug <laughs> uh so uh, we have our annual conference at, at the end of september in toronto uh, at emc and our uh, utility working group will publish a document especially de de dedicated exactly to that subject thank you joanna anything you'd like to add to that answer i'll just say i agree um anarchan recently commissioned a study looking at this exact question and found that uh in the near and medium term generation and transmission transmission infrastructure was not at risk at all we've got enough capacity um in terms of the distribution networks, which are, you know, where electricity is feeding into people's homes, that is, that really depends on your neighborhood. It's it's not at risk in the near term, but, you know, there are going to be some older neighborhoods, let's say downtown Toronto, um, that may need to see some upgrades. But I think the key point is that electric utilities are thinking about this, you know, they're seeing this as a real business opportunity, as a potential risk to manage. Um, they're, they're, they're planning and incorporating all of the new government uh, EV sales targets into their demand projections and investment decision making. So, um, and, and as Danielle said, so much of the increased demand can already be dealt with by just smarter electricity flows of, of what we already have. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about our grid. And, and keep in mind that uh, I, I remember we were part of uh, the Ontario, um, Ontario Electrification Council last fall, Transportation Electrification Council. And uh, I asked the people at uh, the Energy Department of Ontario, how much was it costing Ontario to import oil on a monthly basis? And they did not have that number. So I made the calculation and it's costing Ontario $1.2 billion a month. And when I made the calculation, it was $1.50 a liter. So it means that all this money that you're saving because I mean, on oil, is not produced in Ontario. So that means that all the, the money that is being kept in Ontario is creating jobs in, in Ontario and people get more savings and you can develop a much stronger infrastructure uh, system. Okay, thank you. Next question, uh, Joanna, this is related to your presentation. The Bolt Corolla comparison is a great set of numbers. However, I keep hearing that banks would never finance a $45,000 vehicle for most lower income prospects. So the savings aren't accessible to them. I've talked to banks who don't seem interested in changing their loan rules. Any solutions? Yeah, this is a great question. So yep. I do I do think that continuing to ask your banks about this is important. Um, commercial banks in Canada are constantly looking for ways to be greener and and help you know uh, support new climate initiatives this would be a great one especially yeah. for lower income Canadians and so um, 
you know, keep asking the question, keep showing that you're interested. Um, governments can also play a role here. You know, we've heard from the Ford government that there's no interest in bringing back a purchase incentive. We think it would be a great idea then to explore a made in Ontario solution where um, you're offering or the government's offering uh, zero interest or lower cost loans for electric vehicles. Again, if we're worried about this benefiting the rich, then tailor those, uh, those incentives to lower income. Uh, Ontarians. Uh, and then the last thing is we, we didn't really talk about used electric vehicles uh, today, but um, you know, certain provinces are making EV incentives available for used uh, EVs. We would love to see the federal government uh, follow that lead. And then even uh, in the US is most recent iteration of the of the EV subsidy or tax credit that it's looking at, you know, they they are proposing to make uh, a tax credit available for used EVs. So that that could be another option for um, lower income Canadians or even middle income Canadians. The, actually, the used EV rebate is one and one of the mandate letters of the ministers. It has been in mandate letters <laughs> for since 2015 and uh, <laughs> we haven't seen any movement on it. So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully the uh, provincial leadership on that, U.S. leadership on that, might help the the federal government to to reconsider. Okay, regarding uh, governments and electric fleet vehicles, how do we encourage governments to purchase electric vehicles when their tendering act mandates lowest purchase price? I'm happy to take this one, Danielle. If sure, just go ahead. A quick answer, so. Um, the federal government has a greening government strategy, and uh, they do have commitments to, to electrify their fleets. And the most recent update of that greening government strategy was in the emissions reduction plan uh, that came out a few months ago. And in that plan, it says the federal government uh, is committing to fully electrify its light duty vehicle fleet by 2030. So I think we're not seeing, like, I, I'm not finding that um, that the feds are communicating that very well or or really showing off any progress, but the commitment is there. Hmm. Um, and so so they should not be uh, just, you know, looking for lowest cost options. Okay. This one, I think, is a bit more technical. What is the government doing to encourage vehicle to grid power sharing to shave peak demands to reduce the need for fossil fuel uh, electricity generation? I understand that all the charging standards are in place, and it's just a question of motivation to implement. Um, I understand it. Uh, well, um... This is part of ongoing discussions right now uh, with uh, with many utilities across the country. Uh, there is still some work that needs to be done around that particular topic, but I can tell you that this is a very hot subject these days because uh, utilities want to make sure that they plan properly for this. And part of the key is not technology, it's regulation. So uh, this is something that we will be working on uh, at EMC with Clean Energy Canada and other stakeholders because it's a very important subject. Okay, thank you. The next one is something I've heard asked a few times over the past few months. It seems to be ticking up in uh, people's consciousness. How do we get more attention to EV conversions whereby ICE cars that we're already driving are made electric, which should use less raw materials and make use of already existing functioning vehicles? That's a tough one because uh, it's quite expensive actually to convert uh, a gas vehicle to an electric vehicle. And as more and more electric vehicles from light to medium to heavy duty will go electric, conversion will will look more and more like an, a not very economical uh, solution. So I know some people who do that because it's a challenge. Uh, people who do that because they want to have something that's unique. But from just an economic standpoint, um, it's it's quite difficult to uh, to um, to make it work. But nevertheless, uh, the federal government has announced, um, if I'm not mistaken, 199 million dollars uh, to subsidize EV conversions. 
So uh, we don't have the details about that yet. So I guess we'll hear more in the coming months. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. So that's yeah. uh, quite interesting. That was interesting. in the budget, yeah. Next one, I think this is near and dear to many EV drivers' hearts. How can we get quantifiable targets established for DC charger uptime? Uh, what should uptime be? How long is it acceptable for DC chargers to be down, especially when public <laughs> funds are awarded? There needs, needs to be accountability. Yeah, hmm, very important uh, discussion. You want to go ahead, uh, Joanna? Maybe I'll offer, me? I'll offer some thoughts, but then you, you might know more about this, Danielle. Okay. So... Uh, yeah, reliability of our charging infrastructure is a big issue. I think we've got a lot of work to, to do on charging. First, we need to best understand what Canada's charging needs are across the country and probably broken down by region to support our EV sales targets. Um, second, I think government funding needs to explore um, ways to incent, better incent reliability, um, maybe, or, or maybe it's st developing standards, but, you know, I was talking to a colleague today about China moving from a, a capital expenditure model to, um, to fund charging and, and towards an operational expenditure uh, op op option, sorry. Um, which can integrate kind of reliability metrics into their financing terms. Um, but, but yeah, I think Danielle, I don't know if you have other, other oh ideas. Here. Do I, do I have her? Okay. So, so yeah. So uh, because I've been driving electric car for so many years uh, and uh, most, uh, most networks are members of EMC. So uh, I make it, uh, I make it an obligation that every time I travel, I go to a different network to see how they work. And I speak to a lot of people and, uh, and the, the level of reliability from one network to the other is very different. And so that's, that's a very important issue. That's something that we're working on right now, actually. And we've been talking about this uh, with uh, the federal government because there's $900 million on the line right now for new installation. And we want to make sure that uh, this this new funding uh, is for reliable networks. So uh, I can tell you that the federal government has, has heard us loud and clear. They're aware of the problem. Uh, so uh, so yeah, so uh, they are adjusting to that reality because we want to make sure that the EV owners experience uh, is not uh, spoiled by the fact that they're stopping at a charger that doesn't work or works half the time or uh, you, you cannot connect. Uh, so uh, so these are some issues that are very important. And I can tell you that having been to the US quite a few times with an electric car, I've seen that in the US, I've seen that in Europe. So this is this is a challenge that we must be working on uh, before we hit, uh, we hit the wall. So uh, yeah, that's very important. And to say what's a quantifi quantifiable target established for DC charger uptime, that's something that uh, we're working on as well. And uh, during our conference, we'll be talking about that. Excellent. The next question, in sync with rebates, would you see advantages to have fee baits introduced against gas vehicles? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. So in sync with rebates, would you see advantages to having fee baits introduced against gas vehicles? So presumably the additional costs levied there are helping fund the yeah. EV side of the house. This is, I mean, I've been I've been fighting for a fee bait for 15 years. I haven't won any, <laughs> haven't had any success yet anywhere in North America with this. We I even spoke to the, the California government about 10 years ago about this subject in particular. This is a tough one because um, uh, it's not very popular with politicians uh, anywhere in North America. This is something that's very efficient in Europe. We are seeing the results. So we at EMC uh, are in favor of a fee-based system, but uh, I'll be honest, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I think, <laughs> I think theoretically, it's a great policy option, it would provide a sustainable um, funding source for continued rebates, it would not just encourage the sale of, of electric vehicles or cleaner vehicles or smaller vehicles, it would deter consumers from buying those larger vehicles. But I just, uh, yeah, I haven't seen any political appetite for it. And I'm hoping that as a mandate can have a, a similar effect where automakers themselves um, just engage in cross subsidization where they increase the the costs of or the prices of their higher polluting you know pickup trucks to help fund um, discounted prices for their electric cars thank you tim can i squeeze in one more absolutely jason okay this one is for joanna can you discuss the depreciation rates on EVs being higher than ICE vehicles presented, considering that you used EV prices are almost as high as new? Exactly. So I'll I'll tell you what we did for our analyses, but uh, our, our analysis. But then Danielle, feel free to chime in. So my my um, colleague is helpfully uh, feeding me this information. Apparently, we used a hedonic pricing model which takes into account a number of different variables like minimum suggested retail price, vehicle age, mileage, um, and all electric range. And it's a really common uh, approach to calculating the depreciation of, um, of assets, uh, uh, in particular vehicles. We, we kind of translated or we, we adopted that model from that US uh, study that we were inspired by, the one by Atlas Public Policy. Um, so it was considered, I don't know if the difference is I assume if it if it considered all electric range, then it was looking at differences between EV and ICE vehicle depreciation rates. But um, you know, even in today's context where used vehicles are uh, nearly the same price as as new vehicles, you know, I, I doubt that it's 100% accurate. As <laughs> you know, we no. started doing the best we could. No, the market is crazy these days. So I mean, it, it makes no sense. I mean, I know people who buy cars after two three years. Electric car to two three years, they sell it for a higher price than they bought it. So I think that uh, I think that this uh, this craziness will uh, will slow down soon, hopefully, because I mean it's really the the world is upside down when we're talking about gas cars or electric cars these days. New market, used market. I've been talking to many OEMs over the past few days, and the people are stunned about the market these days. Uh, so uh, yeah. It's, it's a crazy market and uh, you've seen, I mean, we're lucky because in the US, I mean, we're seeing some dealers, you know, ha adding uh, five, 10, 15, $20,000 markups over the uh, you know, MSRP, uh, which is nuts when you think about it, but people are willing to pay for it because they're, they want to go to an electric car. But uh, I mean, hopefully uh, this won't be the same situation a couple of years from now. Okay. Well, Thank you very, very much, both of you, Joanna and Danielle. It's fabulous. This is what happens when you get two EV experts on the same uh, screen on a webinar. It's a whole lot of really great information. Um, I, I know I, I learned a lot. I always learn in these things, but learned a lot tonight. And I really, we all re appreciate very much you both coming on today. I um, also, of course, I have to thank Jason. He's the one that uh, filters through all those questions and uh, keeps us on the straight and narrow. Appreciate that, Jason. And we have some folks who you never see. I always like to acknowledge the, the work that they do in, in putting together these, uh, these presentations. So next month, we get to hear from Matthew Forche, president and CEO of a company called Accelerate, which um, plays on some things we talked about here uh, on this webinar, particularly the supply chain. Um, they represent uh, key public, private sector stakeholders in Canada's zero emission vehicle supply chain. And Matthew's experience and, and role at Accelerate make him uniquely prepared to discuss the topic for that webinar, which is seizing Canada's uh, zero emission vehicle opportunity. So be sure to mark the date. It's Tuesday, September 6th always at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and for tonight, I just really want to thank everybody for tuning in. We really appreciate your participation. I wish we had more time for the questions, but wonderful uh, for you to come every month and join, join us with this webinar.
So from all of us at Electric Vehicle Society, and of course, until next month, we hope you all stay well. This will, Thank you. This, will this will conclude the webinar.